rally his UK troops in just under half an hour in Doncaster with a conference speech designed to kick off his party's campaign for an outvote in the EU referendum, which could be called as early as next spring, though actually speaking to some cabinet ministers earlier this week, it seems now to be pushed back further, much further than that. Mr Farage says his party must be at the heart of the out campaign. But what role would the UKIP leader himself play in the referendum? We sent Giles to the UKIP conference centre at Doncaster Racecourse to find out. UKIP feel they're going up in the political world. No, they didn't get the number of MPs they'd hoped for in the general election. Nigel Farage isn't in Westminster and they've had a few embarrassing internal wobbles. But four million people voted for them in May and they now have eyes on a bigger prize, bigger even than UKIP itself, if they're to win it. UKIP have been very successful in recent years, setting out a stall that overcomes that criticism they used to get of being a one-issue pressure group. But here's the irony. After the general election at this year's conference, there is only one topic on the agenda. It is that one issue and the referendum and winning it is exactly what UKIP thinks it was created for. Less than 15% of UK business is actually done with the EU. 14.4. But they regulate all of it. The party chairman briefing early delegates on how and with what statistics they might convince more than just UKIPers that Britain should leave the EU. For him, it's the only game in town. This is the big battle. It's what we were founded for in '93. And it's what we, you know, this is the big one for us. But don't forget that our development across all policy areas is part of that battle. And UKIP know this battle and its outcome will have profound effects on their future as a party, possibly for its leader. And that much of it will be fought out in a media they often feel is hostile, which is why the leader is perhaps sounding less UKIP than he's ever been. Whilst I've been UKIP for nearly a quarter of a century and I lead the thing and, and I'm proud of many of our achievements over the last few years and I look forward next year to proportional representation elections that are going to happen in London and Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland and so we can increase our elected base across the country. That is not my priority. My priority uh, is to get ready for a referendum. A referendum that would not have happened without UKIP uh, but a referendum that to win we've got to unite all the different elements that want to leave the EU. But I'm told that uniting all those elements is not at the moment proving easy behind the scenes and that some potential supporters are still wary of the UKIP brand. But here, UKIP No campaigners know there's one race, no reruns, and are determined their contribution is not one where commentators can take the pee. Charles Donut reporting there. We're joined um, from UKIP's conference in Doncaster, gl gloriously sunny Doncaster today, by the party's deputy leader, Paul Nutto. Paul Nutto, welcome back to the programme. Morning, Andrew. Good morning to you. Uh, Nigel Farage says that UKIP's not his priority. He's focusing on campaigning for a no vote. Hasn't that got to be at the expense of the party? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, UKIP was created, wasn't it, to get us out of the European Union. And, of course, we should have had more seats in the general election. Four million votes and one seat is pretty much a disgrace and throws into the air the question again of electoral <coughs> reform. But every cloud has a silver lining. And that silver lining is that, that we've now got a referendum on our membership of the European Union. And it's a referendum we believe we can win. A referendum that you said if the country elected a Tory government, we would not get... You got that bit wrong. Uh, well, look, I mean, let's be clear. We only got this referendum because of UKIP. Yeah, but you David said we Cameron weren't going to get it. Give it in the first place. It, ha hang on. In 2013, he was forced uh, to get this referendum to try to shoot the UKIP fox. It didn't work because we went on and won the European elections the following uh, year. And now we have a Conservative government. Granted, we've got this referendum. But as I say, what, what we're doing here at this conference is we're bringing together a load of disparate groups who've campaigned for out for many, many years. Uh, the democracy movement, for example, the Bruges group, uh, the campaign for an independent Britain, under an umbrella organisation, uh, leave.eu. And we're bringing them together with a membership of around 250,000 people. And we're going to run a positive campaign and a campaign, we believe, that can really make a difference. So is it your aim that leave.eu should be the umbrella campaign group for the out campaign? 
Well, it seems to make sense, doesn't it? Because they've brought together all of the groups who've been campaigning to leave the European Union for the past 25 years. So I think it is complete common sense that these, this umbrella organisation should go forward and leave. Because, look, the other guys aren't really doing anything. They're sitting on the fence. They're waiting for Mr Cameron to come back with his renegotiation. What we're saying is that we should gain the momentum now and it should be us that set the bar for the Prime Minister. A bit like a high jumper, really. We set the bar and we say to the Prime Minister, you get over that. But it's not really an umbrella group, is it? I mean, it's bankrolled by your biggest donor, Aaron Banks. It's, it's really a, a UKIP front organisation. It's not an umbrella. It's a front. Well, well, the umbrella, of course, contains a lot more groups. I mean, what UKIP can add to this is we've got the foot soldiers, we've got the people who can go out and deliver leaflets and knock on doors and have street stalls. We are just part of a big number of anti-EU groups who have been campaigning for the past 25 years. And what we want to do is to get started right now. Let's start campaigning. Let's get momentum. Because the yes side have started, those who want to stay in, whilst sure. some of them, the Westminster-based no side, just want to sit on the fence. Well, let's see how big our this umbrella is. Uh, how many Eurosceptic Labour MPs are supporting Leave.eu? Well, we're going to try and bring more people in, including the trade unions. Uh, I know that Kate Howey is, for example, part of the other group. We, what we're saying, actually, so the answer is none. To the other group, the answer is none for so far. Uh, well, let, let me finish. Let, let me let me let me finish. What we're saying to Business for Britain is this: it's a big tent. Come and join. All the other anti-EU groups are part of this. Don't be cut off. Don't just be a Westminster bubble organisation. This is an umbrella organisation which is going to go out there and campaign to real people out in the country. How many Eurosceptic Conservative MPs have joined your umbrella under your umbrella? I, I don't know. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Well, I, I think got you would the know if that. there was one who joined. I, I, hang on, hang on. You would be telling I, me Banks if anyone mounting, had joined. I, hang on. Aaron, ba Aaron Banks is mounting the platform this afternoon. I'm sure that there will be announcements uh, which will come from the Leave.eu organisation. But look, this isn't just about MPs, Andrew. This, this just isn't about Westminster. This is about bringing sure. groups who've campaigned for 25 years together and get out there and meet real people, knock on doors, meet people in the street and really drive this agenda. I can't yeah. see that from the other side. Who, quite frankly, yeah. have been sitting on the fence so long they've got splinters in their backsides. Well, that's an interesting metaphor. Uh, but it's interesting that you've um, <laughs> formed an um, um, umbrella group and the one MP that UKIP has, he isn't even a member of it. He's in a different group. Well, actually, look, look, we've got, we've got, we've got feet in both camps. I mean, Douglas Carswell is part of the other organisation. I mean, they're also being bankrolled by Stuart Wheeler and sure. Lord Pearson. But my is point is, Douglas well. Carswell, so, your look, one MP so, uh, is not part of Leave.eu, yes. correct? Yes. He's not part of it at Why? the moment. What we're saying to business, from, hang on, let me finish. What we're saying to business <laughs> to Britain is. Come and join us. It's a big tent. We need to get campaigning now. We cannot wait for the Prime Minister okay. to renegotiate. We should be the ones who are setting the terms of that renegotiation, which is we want to control our own borders, we want to save money, and indeed we want to make the laws, uh, the, the people who make the laws, to be the people we elect at Westminster and not faceless bureaucrats in Brussels. That should be on the table now and not when the Prime Minister comes back next year. I understood. It's your conference in uh, sunny Doncaster. Uh, if Nigel Farage says UKIP is no longer his priority, who's running the party? Well, of course, Nigel is still running the party alongside with the National Executive Committee. We've got important elections next year, which are PR elections in London, in Northern Ireland, <laughs> in Wales and in Scotland. And I'm pretty sure if you look at the polling, particularly in Wales and indeed in Northern Ireland, UKIP can get seats in those assemblies. And I'm sure, to be perfectly honest, we can come back with a number of I... assembly members in London to boot. You mentioned at the start of our interview the election campaign. You got almost four million votes but only one seat. You're blaming the electoral system, but you know, you knew the electoral system before you went into this election. You knew that the only way you really could get a, a, even a handful of seats was to concentrate your resources on your best bets. So what went wrong? Yeah. Uh, well, look, 
2015 was always a a, 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 a a forerunner, really, for the big one for us, which was 2020. We've always had this 2020 vision where we believe you can, can make breakthroughs. But look, as a result of the 2015 election, which shocked us all, by the way, none of us thought the Conservatives would form a majority. And they won that basically out of fear, fear of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP. We've now got a referendum, which means that politics is on our turf. UKIP now has a window of opportunity over the next five years, and it'll be down to us whether we jump through that window or not. All right. Paul Nuttall, uh, thanks for breaking away from your conference and uh, joining us uh, there. We'll be coming live to Mr Farage's speech in the next 20 minutes or so. Hope the sun holds up for you. Uh, I see a few clouds actually gathering at the back there, but don't be worried about them. Uh, how would you categorise, uh, Owen Bennett, the, the position that UKIP is in since the election? Because... Because the, the media was so consumed by the Mr. Corbyn's election, they've, they've kind of taken a back seat in public perception. I think the problem that UKIP had was actually it went sort of the political cycle went UKIP, SNP, Corbyn. So they're sort of slightly behind even, even before Corbyn came along because of what happened in Scotland. I think they're, you know, they're, they're sort of bordering on the irrelevant at the moment, UKIP. And I, and I don't mean that in, in a sort of very sort of negative way, but the fact is that we know what they think about the EU. We know they want to get Britain out of the EU. Mm. 3.8 million people voted for them in the general election. If Mr Farage was not part of the out campaign, those 3.8 million people are not suddenly going to decide to vote to stay in the EU. They've already made their mind up. We know their view. So in a way, if you're running the out campaign, why do you need Nigel Farage anymore? Who's he going to persuade? Everyone knows what Nigel Farage thinks. So what is he bringing to the table other than something which Suzanne Evans said on your programme a few months ago, an air of divisiveness? I think that's the problem that they've, they've got to get across, which is interesting today. The language we're hearing from Nigel Farage on Newsnight last night, for example, was this is a celebration of the referendum, he's trying to be positive, he's trying to be upbeat. And that is certainly a marked contrast to the rhetoric that was coming out during the general election. But you're a sceptic Tories and Labour uh, um, MPs, politicians, supporters. They're not going to let Nigel Farage run the out campaign. They may make room for him to be part of... Uh, an umbrella organisation which is wider than leave.eu. But they won't let them run it. No, they won't. And then what happens to UKIP then? Because you heard some of the language then from Paul Nuttall talking about the other campaigns sitting on the fence for so long they've got splinters in wherever. Mm. All of a sudden it sounds like they're attacking the people on their own side already, you know, sort of five minutes into that interview. So there's going to be this perception that if they don't get Farage on board, is he going to point the guns at his own side instead of the people who want to keep them in the EU. And I think Farage has got, and UKIP have got to work hard to say, look, even if we're not the main striker on the pitch, we'll do the defensive midfield up role, mm. we'll use our ground troops, we'll use our people's army to deliver the leaflets still, and we'll still be part of it in that respect. I think okay. if Farage pitches it like that, there is a place for him. OK, we shall see.